Hey, this is Survey of the Nonprofit Sector, Lecture 9, Philanthropy as an Artifact of the State. Okay, most of this is going to come from uh, Rob Reich's Just Giving, uh, though there will be a few things uh, from outside of that. Okay, first, uh, two questions. Who is a philanthropist and what is philanthropy? So, Laura Ari Ariaga and Teresen. Uh, she's the author of Just Giving 2.0 and the founder and board chairman of St the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. She says that a philanthropist is anyone who gives anything, time, money, experience, skills, and networks in any amount to create a better world. And then Rob Reich, uh, the author of Just Giving, who I just mentioned, uh, mentions that philanthropy is sometimes described as a private action in the public interest, uh, the direction of private assets to produce public benefits. On giving. Uh, so philosophers, uh, ancient and modern, have thought a lot about giving and they kind of come to the similar conclusions. I think this is really interesting. So um, thousands of years ago, Aristotle said, to give away money is an easy matter and in any man's power, but to decide whom to, to whom to give it and how large and when and for what purpose and how is neither in every man's power nor an easy manner. Um, Holden Karnofsky, who's a co-founder of GiveWell, he said, trying to maximize the good I accomplish with both my hours and my dollars is an intellectually engaging challenge. It makes my life feel more meaningful and more important. It's a way of trying to have an impact and significance beyond my daily experience. So how much to give has usually been considered an issue of individual morality, but Rob Wright makes the case that it's philanthropy or giving is also an issue of public morality and thus should be in the realm of political philosophy not just moral philosophy so how is philanthropy public one reason is that philanthropy is a form or exercise of power uh, private decisions intended to affect the public so the public should have a say if you're going to do something good that affects other people maybe those people should have a say in what that means um, we also have policy. So taxpayers subsidize philanthrop philanthropic giving and the work of nonprofit organizations here in the United States. Uh, so there's some stats. Um, as of 2016, Americans donated $390 billion. Um, of that, $281 billion come, came from in, individuals, uh, about 72%. And um, we subsidize or as we've talked about previously, the tax expenditures or the amount of money that we forego, forwent or didn't collect in taxes was at least 50 billion in 2016. Um, so what Reich is wanting to do in this book is shift the thinking about what the role of philanthropy is and what it should be. So he's taking a normative perspective on how should we view and regulate and tax philanthropy in the United States. Um, he mentions that there's almost no systematic thinking, scholarly or otherwise, in the political philosophy literature, which is pretty interesting because political philosophers have actually touched on um, issues related to this, and he's actually going to review some of this, uh, which we're going to go over in chapter one. Uh, Reich's two major questions. Uh, what is the role of philanthropy in a liberal de democratic society? And then second, the more normative question, what role should philanthropy play? Um, so if we think about this from the perspective of political philosophy, different questions arise, such as what attitude should a state have towards the preference of individuals to give away money for a public purpose? What role, if any, should philanthropy have in the funding or distribution of essential, of essential goods and services? When is philanthropy an exercise of power deserving of democratic scrutiny? Is philanthropy always remedial or second best to justice? How, when, and should the state frame, shape, subsidize, limit, or block individual preferences to give money away? And under what circumstances and for what purposes, if any, should associations be granted a corporate form with special tax treatment as a nonprofit organization, for example? We've talked, of, um, we've touched on, or we've hinted at some of these questions earlier in this class, but now we're going to really uh, scrutinize and think about the answers to these questions going forward.
Um, our first instinct, though, when we think about philanthropy is always to compare it to other things that other people can do with their money. You can spend your money. Uh, we call that consumption. Or you can invest your money uh, with the hopes of having it grow. Um, and when you compare philanthropy to consumption or investment, it always comes out better. We, we view people who give um, better than we view people who just consume or just invest their money. Um, and so that's our first instinct. Well, if they're going to give, that's good, and I, I shouldn't judge that. Um, Reich wants to change that view. Um, he wants to dislodge that, and he's saying um, the comparison shouldn't just be with other things we do with our money, but the question should be, is philanthropy good for society? Um, so just the fact that giving is good in general, that may not necessarily mean that it has good consequences for uh the people that are the benefit intended beneficiaries of that philanthropy or even for society in general um he says we need to think about philanthropy as part of the larger political econ political economy of the marketplace and corporate activity of government spending and public agencies um, we need to think of it as a potential exercise of power that warrant that warrants democratic scrutiny um, and is having the potential to help poor people, but also entrenches the wealthy elite and helps them maintain their position as elites. Um, he says, and this I, I think is really important, one of the primary aims of political theory, it is often said, is to establish the grounds on which to favor one set of legal, political, or economic rules over another. So what are the grounds or the basis or philosophy or theory on which we're setting certain legal or economic rules above another. So we have rules in the tax system about how to become a, what it takes to become a nonprofit organization and what happens if someone donates their money to a nonprofit organization. What are those grounded on and do we have maybe a better or more just or equal um, reason to maybe change those rules? Um, Philanthropy has unavoidable political dimensions. So more questions here. What effect does this private action have on the body politic? How does it change, if at all, the relationship among citizens, especially between the donor and the recipients? Um, can philanthropy undermine or crowd out legitimate state interests? Might philanthropy be an exercise of private power with objectionable public consequences? Are the strings that donors sometimes attach to gifts objectionably paternalistic? Uh, does donor direction beyond the grave throttle the agency of future generations to channel philanthropic assets? Is perpetuity a defensible time horizon for philanthropy? And then finally, does big philanthropy undermine political equality? So there's basically three dimensions or three levers that we can think about when changing public policy or thinking about the policy related to philanthropy. The first one is tax treatment of donations. So, so should charitable don donations be subject to any favorable tax treatment? If yes, should the tax ramifications be what they are today? Is the charitable contribution deduction defensible? Uh, second is how we define the nonprofit sector. So the questions here, how should a democratic society define what counts as a nonprofit or non-governmental organization? Um, relative to the status quo we have now, should there be stricter or looser criteria for what organizations qualify for status as a public charity or private foundation? And then perhaps um, can we better reflect re redistributive or other aims as part of that definition? And then finally, uh, in limiting philanthropy? Are there some kinds of private donations that should be constrained, disallowed, uh, or independent of whether they are favored of favored by tax concession? Uh, what time horizons, uh, if any, should orient philanthropy? Okay, let's move on to Reich Chapter 1, An Artifact of the State. So what Reich's going to do here is first he uh, acknowledges the standard history of philanthropy, but then he moves into a bit different uh, look throughout history of how different societies or people have viewed philanthropy. And he grounds this in ones that have considered philanthropy as it relates to the state. Um, and this is important because the question that he's seeking in this book is, is philanthropy or 
should we consider philanthropy part of our political theory? And if we do, then we need to look to the past and see what others have done or what um, others have said about how philanthropy relates to the state. Okay, now coming back to these standard histories. So often when you hear about philanthropy, you'll hear that you know the Greek origin of philanthropy comes from the Greek and it stands for uh, love of humanity. You, of, you often hear about the Judeo-Christian roots of charity uh, from the Bible, um, the spiritual calling to assist the sick and the poor. So Acts 20.35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, in uh, Anglo-American history, we often talk about uh, medieval Elizabethan statute of charitable, charitable uses in 1601. It was really the first law to define what would be recognized as official, um, politically sanctioned charitable purposes. Um, it assigned the state some authority over the creation and expenditure of many private charitable trusts that had been created, um, mostly within the church and it, for many different purposes. Um, so often you'll hear about this history. Um, I, I re one reason I like Reich is he's going to give us a little bit different history that we don't often talk about here in the United States. So one is the litur liturgical system and antidosis procedure in ancient democratic Athens. Um, number two is the creation of the waqf, uh, which is a forerunner to the private foundation. And this um, was in Islamic societies, started in the 9th and 10th centuries. Really interesting. And then we're going to end talking about the attitudes of um, Turgot and Stuart, John Stuart Mills, um, who were uh, influenced by the Enlightenment, about progress, what does progress mean, uh, individual rights, utilitarianism, the idea of the most good for the most, um, the best policy is the one that helps the most people and leads to the greatest happiness for the most people. Um, so we're going to end spending some time talking about their thoughts on foundations and endowments. Okay, the liturgical system in Athens. So this was a system where uh, wealthy citizens were expected to make voluntary contributions for various state projects um, that benefited the entire citizens. Um, it's estimated that the sum of all these liturgies accounted for more than half of all state revenue in the fourth century Athens. Um, uh, one scholar describes it as compulsory philanthropy uh, and you could either have festival liturgies or military liturgies. So where rich people either paid for plays, athletic competitions, or they paid for the funding of defense and war needs. And we're gonna focus more on these military liturgies. Um, so with limited mechanisms for taxing and public finance, Athens developed this system of philanthrop th philanthropic funding for military needs. Um, it had elements of voluntarism and compulsion. So how it worked, was a wealthy person was appointed to provide for the needs of the military, the liturgy. And then this person, this is the interesting part, this person could challenge a more wealthy person to take their place. So if they said, hey, this other guy's got more money than me, why isn't he paying for this military need? Um, he could do that, or she, I guess. Um, and then if the challenger refused, then the initially appointed person could offer to exchange estates with the wealthier person and with that person's estate now in possession, carry out the liturgy. If the, if the challenger refused to swap estates, the, then it would be referred to a court hearing with peers serving as jurors. Um, the court would then decide which of the two disputants would carry forth the liturgy. So what did this do? What were the effects of this system? Um, I think first, it, it prevented wealth concealment and the avoidance of taxation, which was something we are worried about now with very rich people. Um, second, it furnished Athens with the funds it needed for essential public services while delegating to the wealthy the decision about who would provide the funds. Um, no wealthy person could uh, claim that it was unfair because they could always challenge another person who they thought that had more money. And then finally, it created some democratic control over wealth while still preserving certain privileges for the wealthy, such as honor, gratitude, and status as a civic benefactor. And we're gonna see that status is a very important part of um, philanthropy among the rich. Okay, the waqf in Islamic society. So as I mentioned, this came about in the 9th and 10th centuries. Uh, this is separate in that this was not 
part of the Quran. The Quran had separate um, teachings about philanthropic giving. This came about sort of um, in society and is not specifically mentioned in the Quran. Um, the mechanism of the waqf is pretty simple. Uh, a living man or woman can create a waqf by relinqu relinquishing ownership of private property, usually real estate, but sometimes just cash for the support of a designated social service or other beneficiary. These were permanent and they were meant to provide revenue in perpetuity. And once they were established, they were irrevocable. Um, this uh, created some private advantage. So it usually was shielded from taxation. Um, and again, those who created the walks or donated their um, cash or property uh, for the walk got social, social recognition and they were seen as a very um, especially pious person. Um, they were a defining feature of Islamic civilization and um, in a lot of ways really predated our modern foundations in the United States and we're going to talk more about that in a second. But as um, we look um, in history, um, most of the mosques constructed in the Middle Ages were funded by the Waqfis uh, system. Every soup kitchen in the Ottoman Empire was a waqf in Istanbul in the late 17th century. Um, there was a waqf that served food for an estimated 30,000 people per day. Okay, so that's a huge, huge um, waqf that's basically a nonprofit organization serving food every day. Um, by the 1800s, there are records that show 20,000 waqfs in the Ottoman Empire. Um, generating annual revenue equivalent to one-third of annual state revenue. So this is huge. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, according to some scholars, they looked at land records and walk deeds. When the Republic of Turkey was founded in 1923, 75% of all uh, arable land had been set aside in walks. So what were the effects of these? Um, the institutional design of the walk uh, created a legally sanctioned and supported flow of private funds for social services, of many different kinds, and did so in a way that facilitated their intergenerational provision, extending often across centuries. Um, not only did it persist across, across generations, but it um, persisted through different political uh, arrangements. So uh, a walk could survive political upheaval, um, and it was also really hard religiously because if a waqf was donated to God in a way, if you were trying to take away a waqf, it was not viewed as a pious act. Um, we still have walks to, walks today in Islamic society, but there's a lot less um, and their legal status has changed dramatically and mostly because of the effects of nationalization, modernization, and then rationalization of the state in the 19th and 20th centuries. And a lot of this is the effects of, honestly, the British Empire. Um, now, walks has four bears to the modern private foundation in the United States. So modern private foundations that we have, you can think of the Hewlett Foundation, uh, the Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, there's many, right? We have these foundations in the United States and they are very similar to the walk. So how are they similar? Um, like a walk, the private foundation co uh, consists in a legally sanctioned establishment of endowment whose assets and income genera generating revenues are directed to a fund to fund a wide variety of public benefits. So the way an endowment works is you get a big pile of money, you set it aside and say, okay, this is what this money is for. Okay, that money is invested in the market and it gets returns on the market. It makes interest. That interest is then used for some public service or public benefit while the endowment money never changes or never goes away. That way it can, it can last in perpetuity as long as the market continues to do well, which it has over the course of um, basically modern society, late 19th century, even going back into 18th, 16th century. We have reason to think that the market has had been positive since then for the most part. Um, like a walk, the assets of a private foundation are <clears throat> generally exempt from taxation. And so the decision to establish a foundation is also a way to shelter wealth from taxation. So if you know the, the um, maybe the state's going to take it away anyway, well, why don't I just use some of it uh, for what I want it to do 
uh, to benefit society rather than what the state wants to do to benefit society. Um, the private foundation enshrines fidelity to in donor intent and so goes beyond the death of the donor. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a second. Turgot and Mills have a lot of thoughts about the role of um, the donor's original intent and whether the a dead person has rights to their property as after they've died. Um, like a walk, both the donor's directives and the assets of the foundation are legally designed to last in perpetuity. And then like a walk, the provision of pu public benefits through private foundation constitutes a form of limiting the authority of the state by decentralizing the production and distribution of public goods. Um, just as an aside, the growth of foundations in the United States um, in 1930, we had 200 private foundations with 1 billion in assets. Uh, as the years went by, the number of foundations continued to grow. 2000 in 1959, 30,000 foundations in 1985. And then a few years ago, five years ago, uh, at the time of this recording in 2014, we had 100,000 private foundations with $800 billion in assets. Um, there are questions about WACFs, so they're really interesting in the sense that they kind of predated what were, but were uh, designed, and that design is um, kind of lived on in the modern private foundation. But there are questions about uh, WACFs and democracy. Um, so in Islamic society, it was not a democracy, right? We had a theocracy, and so it was not embedded within a kind of democracy. Um, there's scholarly con controversy about whether this widespread creation of walks and the all the land that was untaxed, their perpetual existence, might be part of the reason why democracy did not take root earlier in, in Islam or in Islamic states. Uh, one of the people who argue this is Tam Tamir Kuran. He um, said that the walk system bears chief responsibility for sustaining autocracy and retarding democracy in the Middle East. Uh, his explanation is complex and controversial, but among the reasons he emphasizes is the rigidity and inflexibility of the waqf system, um, where each waqf has, was harnessed in perpetuity to purposes assigned by the, the initial donor and legally blocked from altercation or adaptation to evolving social needs. Um, Curran doesn't make, the, make this connection. This is something Reich really noticed, is that waqfs really um resemble current uh foundations and there's a reason to think that they're not compatible with democracy yet in our current society we have foundations in a de democratic society coming back to this issue of perpetuity assigned by the initial donor if you think about one person one vote right um someone an initial donor with their intent their vote gets locked into place early on and then even if they die that is still basically their vote right and um so even as social needs evolve that vote is still locked into place forever um so you might you could make the argument that some of these old philanthropists let's take rockefeller for example um had he been alive today he may have been really concerned with something like climate change but because that wasn't an issue of his time he was not concerned with it. So um, we have all of these resources that Rockefeller set aside, but they're not used towards maybe what might be a bigger challenge than what he, uh, what that foundation is working on. Now, not to say that it's not, that's just providing an example of why this may not be, why one reason why it may not be compatible with democracy. Um, democracy is meant to, uh, adapt to the changes and the votes of the people that are currently living and uh, with this per perpetual um, d vote that 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 was created early on um, maybe that's not democratic okay the enlightenment endowments in europe um, the widespread adoption of perpetual endowments in europe coupled with their accumulation over centuries uh, eventually gave rise in the 18th and 19th centuries to resistance and criticism. Uh, the context of this is the Enlightenment um, and its suspicion of religious authority and and its ambition, uh, the really the ambition of the Enlightenment and Enlightenment thinkers 
was to deploy reason on behalf of social progress. Um, across Europe in the early 1700s, there was this unease with the mortmain, literally the dead hand, uh, which is the perpetual and inalienable corporate ownership of real estate, most often that of the church and its threats to national security. So how would be, um, how is philanthropy uh, a threat to national security or how is an endowment a threat to national security? Um, the answer is that only private property owners rather than stewards of philanthropic endowments would be likely to defend their property from a foreign invasion. So if everything was tied up in endowments, um, then there would be no pro private property owners to defend the land. Uh, so this is a worry, but again, this, there's this thought, right? In Turkey, 75% of the land was tied up in walks. Um, in Europe, there was the fear that if no one owned the land, and this gets, gets in a little bit to um, classical liberalism, right? We're talking about freedom and the, the property ownership. If no one owns the property or feels any ownership towards it, they're not gonna want to protect it. And this was the, the fear in uh, Enlightenment era Europe. Okay, Turgot or Turgot and Mill. So uh, Turgot uh, lived 1727 to 1781. Um, he's considered one of the founding fathers of economics as an independent social science, uh, him with Adam Smith. And he's also the founder of the ideology of progress. Um, this is the idea that basing political authority, social organization, and public policy on reason would bring about constant improvement, that humans and civilization were capable of steady betterment. Um, uh, we, sometimes we call this rational meliorism. Meliorism is the idea that uh, you can, humans can make things better. And so if we're rational about that or thinking logically, we can slowly make things better and better. Um, this is sort of second nature to us, but for Turgot, this was a this was a big new kind of idea. Um, and then we have John Stuart Mills, 1806-1873, uh, very influential uh, political philosopher and moral philosopher. Um, his ideas on liberty justified individual freedom in, in opposition to the state and social control. Um, his basic idea: individuals free to do as they wish unless their actions harm others. Uh, he was also a proponent of utilitarianism, which is the idea of the greatest good for the greatest number. And we're going to see as Mill struggles with the issue of foundations, his strong views on individual liberty and rights to property kind of clashing with his views on utilitarianism. And this is one reason I really like Mill and think he's really interesting. <clears throat> because on one hand, if you think about uh, private foundations, this is an individual making decision about their individual private property and they should have the freedom to do that. But on the other hand, do, do those decisions lead to the greatest good for the greatest number of people? You see Mill kind of struggling with this and thinking deeply about it. Um, he was also quite ahead of his time. He opposed slavery. He was for women's rights, for free markets. He was a promote, proponent of free speech. So John Stuart Mill was a very, very influential moral and political philosopher. Okay, Turgot's view on uh, foundations and um, endowments. So uh, some of these ideas uh, we, we kind of already talk about, um, but Turgot was maybe one of the first to kind of voice some of these opinions. So his first idea was that um, charitable provision was, for the needy was, shouldn't be celebrated if it failed to address the source of the need. Um, he laid out the case that charity can be set in a dynamic that subsidizes idleness, neglects the underlying cause of the problem, um, and then provides reason for beneficiaries to remain objects of need. Um, he noticed, uh, I'm not sure how empirical or true this was, but it could be, that where philanthropic resources were most abundant, misery is more common and more widely spread than elsewhere. Now, this is kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? Um, where the poor, you would hope that where the poorest and most misery ridden people are, there would be the most help. But then you could also maybe see on the flip side that people may be more um, lazy and um, uh, used to receiving the help, and so they're less um, willing to work. Um, so it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem. Um, his second uh, issue was that 
uh, foundations were nothing but the projects for the self-aggrandizement of donors. Um, so to establish a foundation, he writes, is to assign a fund or sum of money in order to its being employed in perpetuity, fulfilling the purpose of the founder had in view, whether that purpose regards divine worship or public utility or the vanity of the founder, often the only real one, uh, even while the two others serve to veil it. So what he's saying here is that often rich people start foundations for their own vanity, but they do it um, saying that they're um, either serving God or they're serving the public. So he's saying they'll say that they're serving God or the public, but really they're just serving themselves. Third, Turgot voiced strong opinion to the legal argument, uh, legal arrangement that permitted foundations to exist in perpetuity and for the intent of the initial founder to determine the purpose of the philanthropic fund across generations. So there's two reasons why he was against perpetuity. The first was uh, the trustees who were charged with managing the foundation after the founder dies will never do it as well as the donor. Um, he said founders deceive themselves if they imagine that their zeal can be communicated from age to age to persons employed to per perpetuate its effects. So um, no one's going to be as good or as zealous for that cause as the original donor. And then second, um, and this is maybe more important, no person is so wise as to be able to anticipate the needs of future generations. No foundation's purpose and doubt in perpetuity could guarantee its social utility. We don't know what's going to be a problem in the future. We don't know what are going to be the needs of the future. And so if we set up a foundation in perpetuity with a specific cause in mind, that cause may not be even matter in the future. And so if we can't do that, why, why are we having um, foundations that are perpetual? <clears throat> Uh, I really like some of these quotes from Turgot. Um, so this first one, he says, <coughs> excuse me. If all the men who have lived had had a tombstone erected for them, it would have been necessary in order to find ground to cultivate, to overthrow the sterile monuments and to stir up the ashes of the dead to nourish the living. So what's he saying here? He's saying, if we all die and we all have our little grave spot, eventually you can imagine a time in the planet where there's no more land left, where every single spot is a grave site. And he's making an analogy to a foundation where eventually if everything gets tied up in foundations, we're not going to have any more ground to cultivate it with. And so it necessitates us tearing those up a bit, stirring them around so that we can actually nourish the living so that we can actually uh, plant things that will grow in that land rather than wasting that land as a gravesite. Um, he also makes the case that these are not natural. These are created by society. And so because they're created by society, they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't exist a moment after they've ceased to be useful. Uh, this is interesting because current laws in the United States and many other countries don't merely permit the establishment of permanent endowments with the mission defined in perpetuity but they favor or stimulate the creation of such endowments with tax benefits. Okay, let's move on to Mills. So Mills was a huge fan of Turgot, um, but he did disagree. So his general argument was that endowments should be permitted uh, and in some cases even celebrated, but that they should never be perpetual and that the state should always retain the, the right to intervene in a philanthropic endowment. Um, so unlike Turgot, he rejected that um, foundations should never exist. Um, and so he spent his time trying to develop a framework for understanding how, uh, how a democratic government could and should make endowments socially useful. So again, as I mentioned previously, um, his utilitarianism led him to be very critical of foundations and that w w question whether they were actually doing good for society. Mm -hmm but his views on individual rights made him have sort of defend their existence or the rights of individuals to create them in the first place. Um, so Mill's main question, would state control over foundations amount to a violation of liberty, property, and first principles of justice? Um, so similar to Turgot, he uh, said that to permit, permit foundations to exist in perpetuity amounts to making the dead judges of the ex exigency, exigencies of the living and that under the guise of fulfilling a bequest, uh, 
A foundation transforms a dead man's intentions for a single day into a rule for subsequent, subsequent centuries. Um, he also claimed that the dead have no property rights. Neither do the trustees of foundation who serve as successors and are obligated to carry out the, the purposes. And this is really interesting. Mail says that to the extent that there is a property interest, it's not in the trustees, it's actually the intended beneficiaries. Um, so if there is anyone that should have claim to those, uh, to that property or to that money in the endowment, it should be whoever the intended beneficiaries were from the original donor. Um, one issue with this is that donors create foundations to manage the endowment, which are incorporated as corporations. And in modern society, we have corporate rights or this legal fiction of a corporation which can act as an individual. Um, they're legal personifications, they can process property, they can sue, they can be sued, they can do a lot of things that an individual can do, but when you think about what is a corporation, it's something we've created in our head. It doesn't exist in reality, it's just a group of people, right? Um, but no individual person share or bears the burden of uh, the legal burden of that corporation. Um, and so it's the sort of legal fiction that we've created in our heads, but it can own property. Um, so what was Mill's response? He said, neither dead persons nor corporate entities should be entitled to any rights, or at least the rights of the same kind of significance that we attach to living persons. Um, and he comes at this from a moral perspective. He says, the only moral duties which we are conscious of are towards living beings, either present or to come, who can be in some way better for what we do or forbear. So how do we, if, if we allow the state to then intervene in endowments, what is the criteria? How do we do that? First, um, intervention is only warranted for purposes of social utility. And then second, if the government does intervene and take over the endowment, it has to stay as closely as possible to the intentions of the founder. Um, if the state confiscates an endowment for the for any purpose, they can't do it to um, pay off state debt or diminish tax burdens. So you could see a situation where uh, legislators or political leaders would say, hey, if I can just take over that endowment, I can win votes by re reducing taxes or paying off debts. And so Mill was concerned about that. And he said, if that's the reason why you're gonna take over an endowment, you can't do it. It can only be if there's social utility. So what, do, what does the social utility mean? Well, if the endowment has l outlived its purpose, if, if, it's no, if the original intent has, is no longer relevant, then it can take it over. Um, it, but it also kind of has to try to stay as close as they can to the intentions of the founder. So there's a tension between these two, which I think is good. Um, and then Mill makes an argument for endowment. Um, first, he says governments are fallible. Um, so it shouldn't block or deter others from attempting to provide the same goods in different ways or from attempting to provide different goods altogether. Um, endowments protect minorities. So in a, in a, in a demograph, democratic government, it's the opinion of the majority that gives the law. So by allowing foundations and endowments to uh, help the public, um, that's a way for a minority view to have its voice be heard or have its effects be made. Um, and so, it, in a way, endowments protect minority interests. And then third, um, democratic states permit um, what we, or sorry, foundations help us with experiments in living. Um, so it's harder for a state to make an experiment and see what's going to work, what sort of interventions are going to work in society. And so, uh, if foundations and endowments make these experiments, that's maybe more, a more efficient way. Okay, so Mill's view in sum, endowments protect minority interests, they provide experiments for living, and they may fill in where government is infallible, but no man can predict the future, and so perpetual endowments will lose utility, and then um, that people don't have property rights anyway, so the state should be able to intervene and take over an endowment if they can show social utility, if they can adhere to the founder's vision, and then don't use this as a way to lower taxes or pay off debts. 
And then if there are property rights for anyone, it should be the donor's intended beneficiaries. Okay, that's it for today.